It's always a great personal honor for me to participate in the city of LA's LGBTQ Heritage Month. And this year, like everything else, it's different, but it is so meaningful and so important that we're together. Hi, I'm Mike Fewer, the Los Angeles city attorney. I'm very proud to be an ally of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer question and questioning community. Uh, from my time in the state assembly, representing Hollywood and West Hollywood, writing laws to advance equality on taxes, healthcare, and retirement benefits for same-sex couples, to my current role as city attorney, standing up for victims of hate crimes and leading the nation and filing briefs with the US Supreme Court to defend the LGBTQ members of our workplace, to assure protections under Title VII, take a stand against discrimination in the Colorado Baker case, and of course, to support marriage equality in 2015, because being able to marry whom you love is a fundamental civil right. And the city of Los Angeles needs to be always in the forefront of epic battles like that. This year, the theme for LGBTQ Heritage Month in the city is frontline advocacy, honoring those who are working tirelessly during the pandemic. And I am so very pleased to be here to honor Bienestar Human Services. Bienestar hasn't only worked during the pandemic to ensure its clients continue to receive wraparound health services. It's been around working since 1989 as a lifeline to LA's LGBTQ community, and in particular, the Latinx transgender community. I'm very pleased today to be joined by Oscar De La O, who serves as Vice President of Bienestar Human Services. I'm very proud to be able to honor, Oscar, your organization's crucial community work. Welcome, Oscar. Could you please tell us a little bit about Bienestar? Sure, good afternoon, and thank you very much for including us in the LA community as you celebrate LGBT. Um, Bienestar started 32 years ago to address a specific issue around HIV. Since that time, we have expanded our services to include mental health and substance abuse, outpatient treatment, and most recently, a health clinic. But always with the focus of removing barriers that our community encounters that are the products of poor health outcomes. So for us, it's the empowerment of the individual and advocating on their behalf. You know, thank you, Oscar, for that. You know, a big part of what Bienestar does and what makes your work so vitally important is that your work is culturally relevant to the communities you serve. Can you explain what does that mean? For us at Vienna it goes way beyond the hiring of individuals that reflect the communities we serve or making sure that uh, they speak both languages. It is about incorporating the needs of the individual that while we might not be addressing immigration issues or economic issues, they are still part of the modality of how we deliver services. Because unless you address the individual's day-to-day -day needs, you are not able to address the health and well-being issues that Bienestar uh, addresses. So for us, cultural competency comes around ensuring that we are delivering programs that are holistic and have an impact in the entire existence of our clients. Well, and in that regard, tell us about Transgeneros Unidas, the support groups. Transgenero Unidas is one of our great successes. Uh, started 24 years ago by transgender women that were accessing services at Bienestad. Today, they are at each of our six locations running programs around health, but as well as 
advocacy, community mobilization, and a key area that they focus on is the violence, the hate crimes, the discrimination that is part of the daily existence of Latina transgender women. Very important. I, you know, about how, many, about how many members do you have, Oscar? For Bienestar, it's over 4,500 people that we serve per year. Transgender women, it's around 325. You know, we, we know that transgender women, particularly transgender women of color, are disproportionately targeted as victims of hate. And having said that, you know, what are some of the biggest issues that you identify that face the transgender community here in LA? The NSF is part of the hate violence prevention network that we joined in order to bring more resources to the community and to help inform others. The key issues for transgender women is one, the lack of information or the willingness to report incidents of hate violence. Many times they feel that law enforcement or different government entities don't follow through. So they question, well, what's the benefit? In addition, the lack of housing, jobs, their low income, many times puts them at risk to be in the streets, um, not being supported, being vulnerable to our society. And those are things that contribute to them being victimized in many, many ways. And, and you know, I wanna underscore, I think in many of our vulnerable communities, there's this reluctance to report. And I'm glad you raised that point because if the hate crime isn't reported, that means the perpetrator is free to go victimize somebody else. So both for yourself and for others, that reporting is so imperative. And Oscar, what do you think the city, school districts, and the faith communities can do better to support the transgender community? I would say three things. The first one is to inform the community in general, and in specific, the transgender women about their rights to be allies, not just in name, but in action. And third, to advocate for the transgender women to be beneficiaries of the many programs that the city of Los Angeles offers uh, without the limitation of residency, immigration, or certain criteria that many times the programs have, but that we really create opportunities for them and also create safe environments where they can attend, congregate, and be part of. Yes, I, you know, very good. I, I'm curious, Oscar, we've all had to change the way we do business during the pandemic. How has Bienestar had to pivot since COVID? It was, well, it continues to be a very trying time. But back in April, 2020, the first thing that we were encountering was our clients losing their jobs, um, where they were working many times being paid under the table, those businesses were closing. Uh, LA County, the state had a campaign that safer at home for the majority of our clients, that campaign didn't resonate because safer at home meant you don't earn to survive. So they continue to put themselves out there in order to secure their income. In regards to services, it, we encountered the digital divide, the lack of information on how to access 
uh, telemedicine, um, different services that a lot of people are used to uh, utilizing the virtual programs. But Vienna started, did a lot of workshops, worked with our community to remove those barriers. And some services we never closed down for, the counseling, the food bank, the exchange of clean uh, syringes uh, were services that were continued throughout our different centers. You've really gone above and beyond. So let me ask for your wisdom on this. The LA Times reported last week that vaccination rates among Latino men remain low. Why do you think that is? Lack of information, I would say on one hand. The other is the ability to make an appointment which is great that now most places are walk-in, uh, but still they're during hours that might not work with their availability to go and get uh, vaccinated. There's also a large undercount within the Latino community of people that perceive or feel that they were infected, but they never got tested, they never went in, they just stayed home during those days that they didn't feel well. So there's also a strong mentality that I've had it and I will be fine. I think that the, the city, the county can do very innovative programs that takes the vaccine uh, clinics to where you find a large amount of the population. Um, so, so Oscar, you're saying, for example, you know, I was, I was gonna ask what we can do in the city to encourage more Latino residents to get vaccinated. You're saying maybe mobile clinics would be a helpful thing as opposed to the stationary ones, maybe having after hours as opposed to during work hours. What else? Um, and ensuring that this, the records are not going to be shared with anyone else. There's always a concern about immigration, being very clear around an ID, uh, that it doesn't need to be a California ID. Uh, just uh, removing or providing additional information that will resonate with the individuals and I'm sure that will um, get them to test. Very helpful. Is there anything else, Oscar, about Star that you'd like to add? Anything particularly important for our audience? I think uh, having been part of Star for the last 32 years, I can say that it's a very unique organization because we serve a community that's vulnerable that has a lot of resiliency within them. They want to improve their lives. They want to help their families and be good um, civic-minded individuals, but they encounter so many issues, but it is a joy and a privilege to be here at Bienestar. That's very well said, Oscar. Oscar, thank you so much. Really appreciate you. your service to our communities. You are uniquely situated because you are serving particularly vulnerable members of our community at an extremely challenging time. And all of us in the city attorney's office are really pleased to be able to salute Vienna Star Human Services during this LGBTQ Heritage Month.